followed speaking about the importance of research to prevent cancer. And Dr. Anderson explained what's a cluster trial, and she included some possible designs and statistical considerations. Next, we have a very fruitful discussion on prevention in Latin America, collaboration, use of biomarkers. And now we will continue with the second part, speaking about early detection and screening in colon cancer, prostate cancer, and the use of biomarkers in clinical trials. Gareth? Thank you very much, Dasha. To start, I have an honor to introduce Dr. Ian Thompson, Christus Health, San Antonio, Texas. Dr. Thompson is president of SOC committee. He is an oncologist, urologist, with years of experience in uh, design of clinical trials at large scale, a principal investigator uh, S8794 adjuvant radiotherapy in prostate cancer and prostate cancer prevention trial and select trial. He has had several important positions. I have more flowers to throw at you. He has occupied several important positions as president of the Urological Oncology Society. He is now a member of the Board of Scientific Advisors of the National Institute of Cancer of the United States. Welcome, doctor. Thank you very much. Thanks to you. It is a pleasure to be here virtually in Chile. It's a pity not to be able to be there. I'm going to speak about uh, early detection of prostate cancer. <laughs> and prevention. Let's see if I can. Cancer of the prostate is the most common tumor. Prostate cancer is the most common tumor in males. And we have three options. One of them is to wait till symptoms arise. And uh, unfortunately, when symptoms occur, most people have meds and most of them will die. Therefore, there are two options, practical options to control this disease. One of them is early detection and secondly, prevention. Doctor, can you have your PowerPoint in the presentation mode, full screen mode? Perfect, thank you. Before 1983, the only way to detect prostate cancer was through digital rectal examination. But between 1984 and 1990, we started to use prostate-specific antigen, or PSA. At that time, we used uh, antigen more than four, which ab was abnormal, and below that was normal. And the results are still presented like that. Here you can see 5.1, normal level up to four. That's why it is considered elevated. And with that marker, it's possible that this is the most used marker in the world and in the US. We see here that the risk of cancer went up a lot in the first years where we have a males without early detection the level was twice higher than before. At that time, and uh, we'll go back to this in a moment, the PCPT study, Prostate Cancer Prevention Trial, 
the study of the uh, Cancer Institute of the US. There was randomization between sphenosteride and placebo. We wanted to see where the prostate risk could be reduced. After seven years of receiving the drugs, there was a biopsy for all of the participants in the study. And in 2004, we published the outcomes. What happened with PSA? And you can see here the PSA under four, there is a lot of risk of cancer in the biopsy. PSA of three, the prostate cancer risk with biopsy was uh, 25%. The high grade cancer risk was much less, but PSA of 3.9, was almost 10% uh, of people with uh, high grade outcome. And with this information, we were able to conduct the first studies with a calculator for individual risk of prostate cancer with more than 5,000 participants in this study. We had the information to be able to use the calculator. And when we think about the outcomes of a biopsy in a tumor such as prostate cancer, when there are small tumors, low grade, there are three options. One of them is the normal biopsy, no cancer. The second possibility is a low grade tumor. In most of these people, the only thing we do is surveillance, no treatment, because with surveillance, the risk of mortality due to that tumor is one or 2% after 20 year follow up. But currently the reason to do a biopsy is to find a high grade tumor with a risk of mortality. Let's take two examples. One of them, male, 55 years old, without other risks. White, has no family history of prostate cancer. Digital rectal examination is normal. He has never uh, had a biopsy. And when we push the button, the antigen went from 0.2 to 1. That's why people are a bit concerned about the risk of cancer. However, when we type in the numbers in the calculator, the risk is very low. Out of 100 people, 88% will have a normal biopsy. 11% will have a low grade tumor where we won't provide treatment, but just 1% chance of high-grade tumor. In this patient, we can say, do not worry, we will repeat PSA in one year. But this is a 72-year-old African-American man. His father had prostate cancer. His PSA is a bit higher, 6.5, and digital rectal examination uh, finds a nodule. If we type in the numbers, the result is completely different. Almost 40% chance of high-grade tumor. And at that age, the risk of mortality is 75% in 15 years. That's why we and we have the chance to control the tumor in that case. Early detection in the best study in the world, the largest in Europe, there is a reduction of mortality 20%. 
However, you can see here people who took part in the early detection group. There was still a risk of mortality with early detection in the United States after the starting early detection with PSA, mortality due to prostate cancer was reduced by 50%, but we still have mortality though. What is the other option? Prevention. And as I said, in 1991, 1992, the risk of prostate cancer went up at that point the National Cancer Institute realized that we had the option of finasteride. There are several reasons for that. It is possible to prevent prostate cancer with a drug. So we started this study, PCPT, randomized between finasteride and placebo. And after seven years of using the drug, a biopsy. Initially, 24,000 males uh, were recruited. We randomized almost 19,000 throughout the country. And in 2003, we published the results that the risk was reduced by 25%. An interesting thing is that low-grade tumors went down, Gleason 6. There was no impact in Gleason 7, but in high-grade tumors, the risk went up on finasteride and it lasted 15 years. Until when it took 15 years to understand the reason why. This is two or three years later. Finasteride improves sensitivity of PSA. It improves sensitivity of digital rectal examination and also the biopsy. These are the curves that show that uh, sensitivity improves for all of the tumors, Gleason 7 or more, or Gleason 8 or more. In all of those, there was a better sensitivity. There was an improvement in the sensitivity to detect tumors in general and high-grade tumors. And there was an important improvement in the high-grade cancer detection when you do a biopsy, because on many occasions in males that receive placebo, 50% of cases where they found a high-grade tumor in radical prostatectomy, it wasn't in the biopsy. This wasn't found with a needle, but with finasteride, we could detect 50%. There was a 40% improvement in sensitivity to detect high-grade cancer with a longer follow-up. This is the result of a Joe Longer study that will participate on Friday, I think. But you can see with more long-term follow-up, the low risk of cancer is maintained up to 18 years. But the most important thing is the impact on mortality. It is important not to have a low grade tumor since there are risks in terms of treatment, follow up. 50% of people under surveillance receive radiotherapy or undergo surgery. But the question is what is the impact on mortality? with almost 300,000 years of follow-up, a lot of follow-up. Now we know 
the results, and we published this last year, that the risk of mortality goes down by 25% approximately, but it is not statistically significant since with early detection, the risk of mortality goes down so low that there aren't enough patients. We need um, a study with 100,000, 200,000 patients to uh, understand those possibilities. We need a gigantic study and it is not possible to conduct it. But it seems that the risk of mortality goes down. We know that the prevention of prostate cancer is possible with finasteride. After 20 year follow up, seven years of finasteride treatment reduces the risk of prostate cancer approximately by 25 and possible 30%. There is an improvement in cancer detection, especially high grade cancer, which is the tumor that uh, causes the highest risk of mortality. Prevention continues for 18 years, and we are studying this uh, for even longer. And this medication has other advantages. For example, it is a treatment which is very effective for BPH, which is a disease that affects around 50% of uh, males over 60 years old. It seems that it doesn't increase and maybe reduces the risk of mortality due to prostate cancer. So we know now that we can reduce the mortality rate through early detection, and it is possible to prevent prostate cancer, and it is possible to do it. Maybe during the round table, we can discuss other options to prevent prostate cancer. Well, it was a pleasure to be with you. And uh, uh, I'd love to enjoy the other presentations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Thompson, for your presentation. This study you mentioned is very important to reduce prostate cancer. If you have questions, please write them down on Q&A icon. We will see your questions during the round table. Now I'm going to introduce Dr. Corvalan. He uh, graduated at the University of Chile by the ACSFMG in the US. He has a master's degree in cell biology from the University of Chile. He did his residency on pathology in Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York, United States. And he then did a postdoc fellow at the Tokyo Medical and Dental School at the University of Kagoshima in Japan. He's currently professor at the Pontifical Catholic University of Chile. He is a principal investigator of the Advanced Center of Chronic Diseases. His research is focused on molecular basis of gastric cancer, precursor lesions, and non-invasive biomarkers. He has more than 90 publications and seven patents. He's chair of Gochi since 2016. Welcome, Dr. Corvalan. Thank you very much, Deja. I will speak basically about stomach cancer, even 
though I tried to prepare a PowerPoint with Colin, but given the pandemic, it was impossible during the year to make progress along those lines. So I will focus my presentation on stomach cancer. I will share the experience that we have in our lab in clinical, translational, and basic research in the quest for mark biomarkers. I will speak about the gastric cancer scenario in Chile, the cancer burden, the cancer initiatives for gastric cancer, the endoscopic waiting list, the high burden of endoscopies, the campaigns that we do together with the Gastroenterology Society of Chile, and the collaborative efforts for the detection of high risk lesions in gastric cancer and some preliminary results. First, something that has to do with the health burden in Chile. What we do in healthcare as a population is not the best, how we take care of our health our own health is not the best, like salt intake over five grams a day, 99% of the population, a high degree of sedentarism, high cholesterol consumption, and overweight in at least 30% of the population. So it's not a healthy population. This means that we have an important burden of chronic diseases where cancer represents 24%, almost 25%, with about 27% being cardiovascular diseases, and that represents about 50% of our disease burden. And that is the main motivation of the Center for the Advanced Center for Chronic Diseases with Catherine. We are researchers there. It's a 10 year effort of the government of Chile to look for solutions to chronic disease, especially cancer and cardiovascular diseases. And it is a joint effort of the two most important universities of Chile, University of Chile and the Catholic University of Chile. We've also heard that gastric cancer is an important problem in Latin America. Here you can see Chile occupies the third place after Guatemala and Ecuador. And something very interesting, gastric cancer in the Pacific coast is quite high. Argentina is low as compared to Chile, even though we're neighboring countries. Brazil, all, all the figures on the Atlantic side are under 10 per 100,000. And in the Pacific coast, it's much higher. So there's a regional component, which is important to take into account. And Latin America in itself is the third most important region for gastric cancer in the world, representing about 20% of all the world burden of gastric cancer. So this is a pathology that is very important to us. Maybe the most striking in terms or regarding the local gastric cancer problem in Chile with a mortality that hasn't changed in the last 30 years and the gross rates for males, females and average continues to be the same. we do not have a change here in the last years. So this is a pending problem and we don't have a clinical solution right now to that problem. Probably it has to do with the fact that gastric cancer in Chile is not the only problem. This is, has been accredited by the IARC. Here, if we go to the region of Los Rios down south and the region of Antofagasta up north, gastric cancer shows a very important difference. Close to twice in males mortality wise and for females also. So 
in our country, the problem of gastric cancer in the north or in the south is not alike. In that sense, initiatives have been created regarding cancer in general terms. The academic world participates, the Catholic University, the University of Chile and AXTIS, research institutes where we have Gochi as a group developing clinical research on cancer, hospitals that work on, with cancer. We have the Fundación Arturo López Pérez and Hospital San Borja participate together with Gochi in SOC. We have the uh, CHED, the Endoscopy Children Association. We have the Medical Oncology Society and advocacy groups also, and some state agencies or government agencies that provide financing to some initiatives. So some examples about these initiatives in Santiago, we have a project with 100 cases of advanced precursor lesions and about 15 cases of gastric cancer. The Fundación Arturo López Pérez carries out gastric cancer detection campaigns. They call it the Gastric Cancer Month with about 176 asymptomatic volunteers. In the region of Maule, we have had initiatives of specific biomarker projects. We have the Mauco acts this Mauco cohort and other initiatives in some hospitals and more to the south in the region called Araucanía, a region that is that has little access to health care. Endoscopy campaigns have been carried out, headed by Dr. González with about 4,000 patients. This is, work has been done to solve the waiting list. The waiting list is one of the important problems that we have. And I would like to mention a little bit this problem with endoscopy resources. We have the endoscopic waiting list, which is quite numerous. This is a Chilean journal that is published in English. And this is one of the headlines. Health waiting list in Chile, a matter of life and death. State institutions are working on solving this problem. And we have an initiative called Compromiso País, country commitment, where we have what causes the waiting list and clinical management is half of the problem. And there have been scientific initiatives as well. This is from the University of Chile, tabulating in a more scientific way, the increase in mortality associated to this waiting list. And if we go to the pandemic, this has worsened things. This is an announcement three weeks ago saying that to date we have a delay of about 100,000 endoscopies that is on top of the delay that, what, that we had before the pandemic. So I'm not even describing the whole problem. The problem is even bigger and this is called the second pandemic in cancer. So in 2016, Dr. Robinson Gonzalez president of the Chilean Association of Endoscopy, organized these campaigns to try to solve the waiting list problem regarding endoscopy. And he did the work, particularly in this region, Nueva Imperial, where there is a hospital with endoscopy capacity. And all the coastal area of the Araucanía comes here and 
campaigns have been carried out every year with growing numbers of patients, 750 to 1,350. And then we went down to 580. And today we have campaigns of about 500 patients per year. This can pains, we owe them to the Association of Endoscopy. This association started working before on how to perform the endoscopies, which were the right biopsies to detect high risk areas. This prepared, all this prepared the campaigns. The campaigns happen thanks to bringing together the endoscopy association and creating guidelines in order to do the work. And one is the serial imaging of the stomach. And here, I would like to participate, the participation of Dr. Gonzalez, Dr. Laraya, or Chilean doctors that have generated these guidelines. These guidelines are being applied in the campaigns in Nueva Imperial. And finally, the participation of the pathology group doing serial analysis by the gastroenterologist and a systematic analysis that is called OLGA, which is the assessment of gastro gastritis and atrophic gastritis, intestinal metaplasia are part of the Correa's cascade of gastric cancer. So in 2016, we had the first campaign that required a logistic from other groups, including the Ministry of Health and Regional Services and scientific initiatives where we come in, including scientific activity in healthcare activities. This is New Imperial, surrounded by two rivers in the south of Chile, where we have a hospital that is quite well implemented, but understaffed in terms of specialists. And here, 750 patients uh, were studied with 250 samples. We articulated campaigns and scientific activities, and we carried out uh, analysis of markers. Here we have a consolidation of several markers. And this is our publication from 2008. This has been replicated in other populations. We uh, have tried to study the high risk lesions, all GIM 3, 4, which have a higher risk of developing gastric cancer. But this shows what we have managed to do. These data are similar to what Schneider showed. This is for low risk and high risk in Colombia. So it has some correlation to what we have found. They do it in tissue, the studies in tissue, we do it in blood. And after that, we've been developing ultra sensitive markers using nanoparticles as we see here and at least with this, we increase sensitivity enormously. So we can see very early lesions. And we have also explored the possibility of monitoring disease and treatment response. In responders, there is a decrease in the user RPRM. This is a patient with 2,700 copies, drops to zero, and here you can see the MRI, and then it goes up to 4,000 copies. And there you can see the lesion. 
This is a very special gene, not very well known. There are some students interested in evolution, evol evolutive studies, a group of biologists, and we have published this article with the evolution of RPRM. And the interesting thing, we have Reprimo, Reprimo 3, which we discovered. And we characterize Reprimo-like, which is a gene that had some previous data. Alejandro Larcón from my lab studied this. This is a thesis is about to conclude. There are several basic studies. But the interesting thing is that this also worked to distinguish different types of patients. And in parallel, Alejandra Sandoval, writing her thesis, identified an other marker MIR-335 in plasma. We identified that it separated healthy people from sick people. So what I want to say is that we have a whole battery of biomarkers that could be used uh, jointly. Here we have combined the three markers and now do we have a project called Multiplex. We have to performed more activities. We have done more campaigns and we are studying a collaboration with the NIH. We have characterized pepsinogens, which shows interesting uh, risk factors. Pepsinogen could have a space and maybe could be used in combination with the other markers that we are using. These are data that we are preparing in the lab. And finally, we have established other collaborations through the campaigns, which has been very positive in terms of interna internationalizing. This is a work with the European Union with volatile organic compounds. Um, for this reason, we decided to move to another region where we have the Villa Rica Lake. There we have a city with a small hospital, not very modern, but with an endoscopy unit headed by Dr. Copelli, very active. So we created a, a research unit, a container, where we have the basics for our research. This hospital has been built based on containers. It is a usual practice to enhance the capacities. And there we have developed cohorts of intestinal metaplasia. The idea is to follow gastric uh, cancer patients from the perspective of our markers based on this publication, showing that methylation uh, remains, but when it seems that methylation is a marker that remains. So to conclude, we have participated in, through the campaigns in solving the waiting list problem. We have articulated research national and international level, and we are work have worked in biomarker discovery, validation, and development plus thesis, PhD thesis. This for us is only the beginning of a very long road, and that is the purpose of this meeting. We don't walk alone, we walk together. We are in the first stage of initial discovery and validation. And this is a goodbye party of the campaign of 2017. This is 
uh, Mapuche population, the indigenous population of the area. And this is the group that participated in that campaign. Thank you very much. Gracias, uh, Alejandro. Thank you, Alejandro. Hello, me escucha? Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you very much, Alejandro. Thanks for your presentation. As we said before, we're going to have questions at the end. Next, I'm going to introduce our next speaker. Dr. Susan Halabi. Dr. Halabi is Professor of Biostatistics and Bioinformatics at the University of Duke, United States. She's an expert in design and analysis of clinical trials in oncology. She's a member of the Genital Urinary Board of the National Cancer Institute of the United States, and she's a member of the Consulting Committee of Oncological Physicians in the FDA United States. Welcome, Doctor. Thanks for coming. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. And I would like to thank the organizers uh, I think the third is the charm. So I'm delighted and honored to be part of the program uh, because it shows commitment for all to uh, 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 alleviate the burden of cancer in Latin America. So today's talk, I'm gonna focus on uh, incorporation of biomarkers in clinical trial. And I know Dr. Anje Herring uh, will be talking more uh, specifically uh, within uh, clinical trials, but I'm uh, gonna go ahead and uh, uh, share with you um, my thoughts. Uh, sorry, my uh, screen is not moving. Okay, here it is. So uh, in the beginning, we're going to start by defining what a biomarker is. And uh, as you all may know, a biomarker is a characteristic, uh, characteristic that's objectively measured. Uh, it could be an indicator of normal biological processes or pharmacological responses to a therapeutic intervention. There are different sources of biomarkers. It could be tissue or serum or plasma, urine. Uh, it could be uh, radiographic or it could be uh, spit. So these are some examples of well-known biomarkers uh, in different cancer. As you can see, uh, if you look at ER, PR, estrogen, progesterone in breast cancer, this is coming from tissue. If you look, for instance, at uh, CA153 in breast cancer, this is blood. Uh, there are others from uh, saliva, like uh, BRCA1 and 2 could be measured either from saliva or serum. So these are examples of biomarkers that, ha that have been used in uh, therapies. And we're mostly interested in using biomarkers for targeted therapy because there is an assumption here, an implicit assumption that a therapy uh, is designed to affect a particular biological pathway. And uh, normally uh, when we do that, we usually use an assay to judge uh, uh, this, uh, the presence or absence of the uh, target. And uh, as I already indicated, targeted therapy is assumed a priori to work primarily in patients with that target. And here again, I'm using the way target. Uh, uh, and by that, I mean, uh, we may be interested in a group of patients who have the biomarker. So it may be patients who are uh, positive, for instance, for ERPR or any other marker. So this is something that uh, in, in essence is defined as presence, but sometimes a biomarker could be the absence of that biomarker. So there are several types of biomarkers. They're diagnostic, prognostic, predictive of surrogate. 
And in diagnostic biomarker, the primary objective is to identify whether a patient has a specific disease. Obviously, uh, when uh, we're designing clinical trials uh, with the aim of do using diagnostic biomarkers, the patient population will be totally different. Uh, we've heard today uh, uh, from several uh, in the prevention committee talking about prevention trials. So obviously, if uh, the objective is to uh, prevent cancer, uh, then uh, those type of biomarkers may be more useful or uh, we can look at cancer antigens. Uh, and uh, normally when we look at uh, diagnostic biomarkers, some criteria that are really critical uh, to assess are the sensitivity and specificity. And obviously there are uh, challenges uh, in terms of discovery here. Uh, and uh, in terms of uh, looking at a meaningful use of the biomarker, I'm not gonna talk too much about that because um, uh, I'm gonna share with you some references, but these are some of the uh, steps that people look at diagnostic biomarkers. Um, uh, there is of course the first step here is the analytical validation. Then there is the clinical validation. And then there is, uh, uh, we, we have to make the determination whether this is uh, useful or not, whether it has clinical utility and there are other issues to take into account. So in clinical validation, this is where uh, it's determined whether it's reproducible, is the test accurate? We look at sensitivity and specificity. Um, and obviously uh, the FDA sometimes want uh, to have things in a clear certifiable lab. Uh, clinical validation, this is where uh, the biomarker comes into, uh, uh, into uh, consideration in a clinical trial. And then uh, you look at the biomarker results and see whether uh, uh, the biomarker positive patients, do they uh, do worse with regard to survival or uh, progression pre-survival and try to understand the impact of the biomarker uh, with regard to the outcomes. So we're taking it a step from the lab, uh, from the first step to the second step. And uh, a, a biomarker could be diagnostic and uh, it could be well validated um, uh, with the outcomes. But the question, the next step is that does this just improve healthcare? How can we use the result from this uh, in general in the population? I think this is really more important uh, in terms of uh, using it in population level studies. Uh, uh, I know uh, uh, Dr. Newhauser mentioned the SELECT trial and other of the SWAC trials, but you know, like some people uh, previously have used PSA, for instance, as a diagnostic biomarker, although now uh, there is um, a trend not to rely totally on PSA, but that's something uh, to consider in screening and population studies. Uh, and then there are other issues related to cost. Uh, is there value added or cost saved by knowing the results? Do we have a treatment or risk re reduction strategy to implement based on these results? So these are all important uh, stages in uh, uh, considering uh, for a diagnostic biomarker. And now I'm gonna switch gear and talk a little bit about prognostic biomarkers. And uh, by prognostic biomarkers, I mean here, uh, biomarkers that predict prognosis or outcomes regardless of treatment. So for instance, here in this graph, we're looking at uh, uh, survival and uh, we're looking at risk score from a predictive model. And as you can see, the patients with uh, the uh, highest risk score have the worst survival. So cl clearly this tells us that, uh, uh, that this uh, risk score that's based on a biomarker uh, is, uh, is helpful and this could be prognostic. Obviously from a statistical point of view, we uh, perform statistical testing and uh, uh, by using the proportional hazard model uh, <clears throat> in, um, 
in the analysis. So I'm gonna talk for instance, uh, of an example of a biomarker that's based on a model, uh, which I think some of you may be familiar with, which is the Oncotype DX. Uh, the Oncotype DX was used as a, a, a screening biomarker where all patients, all women, over 10,000 women, were uh, randomized, uh, sorry, were screened uh, at baseline. And those who were uh, in the intermediate risk were randomized to either endocrine or endocrine plus chemotherapy. So uh, this biomarker in a way was uh, stratifying patients into different risk group, low, medium, and high, but it's only the one in the middle, uh, the, the medium risk group was used to uh, answer an important question is uh, endocrine uh, only therapy non-inferior to endocrine plus chemo? So that was the question of interest. Now, um, another example is an ambassador trial. This is a trial in neurothelium cancer where uh, the biomarker was used to stratify the randomization because uh, PDL1 was considered to be important and they wanted to balance the uh, prognostic uh, factors uh, here being PDL1. So they want to make sure that the treatment, uh, uh, that there are really no possible biases introduced by not stratifying on PDL1. So this is another use of a prognostic marker in the design of a trial. Now, whereas predictive biomarkers, when we talk about predictive biomarkers, we're looking at biomarkers that predict response to a specific therapy. For instance, we're looking at ER2 predict response to trastuzumab in breast cancer, or you may be looking at IL-2 in renal cancer. And here, uh, the Kaplan-Meier curve here has four different lines. This uh, includes uh, the um, treatment and the uh, biomarker. For instance, here uh, you have uh, the uh, blue line is the standard treatment with le low level of the biomarker, whereas the green line is the experimental arm with low levels. Uh, and as you can see, uh, the experimental arm with high levels in this example was worse. Uh, uh, this is actually coming from a real study in renal cancer. And uh, we noticed that the here, the absence of the biomarker was a good thing. So patients who had low levels and were treated with the experimental therapy did better. So they were uh, considered predictive biomarker. So one way of using a predictive biomarker, again, is uh, to uh, in the design of a trial. And uh, for example, we know that ER2 positive patient uh, respond to trastuzumab. So for instance, in the TOGA trial, it was designed as an enriched trial where uh, almost 4,000 patients with gastric cancer were screened. However, uh, they only elected to treat uh, the positive patients. So those positive patients were randomized to either the standard of care or standard of care plus trastuzumab. And uh, this trial was really, uh, uh, it took a long time as is expected, uh, but I think the beauty of the trial is uh, we know that this is hitting the target and this is what you see when the trial is done and uh, analyzed. Uh, we can see that there is a superior survival in uh, ER2 positive patients who were treated with trastuzumab and the p-value was highly significant. I'm just gonna introduce the idea of surrogate biomarker because that also could be used in uh, population and prevention trials. Uh, so for example, I've already alluded uh, uh, at uh, using a surrogate endpoint. Here, a surrogate endpoint is a combination of two um, uh, biomarkers. One of them is circulating tumor cells and LDH. And uh, what this uh, group of authors did, they classified patients into three groups, uh, low, intermediate, and risk based on the combination of circulating 
tumor cells and LDA. So this is an example where a biomarker here is loosely, uh, uh, we're loosely using the term biomarker, but here it's really a combination of biomarker. And this is very powerful because uh, potentially if this is accepted in the community and you know uh, uh, that overall survival is a, a, a hard to uh, uh, design as an endpoint in a clinical trial, some, some, uh, someone may use uh, the combination of circulating tumor cell and LDH. We're far from there though. So uh, this is again, a hypothetical example. So the question is that we're often faced uh, by a lot of my collaborators. They ask, well, how much verification do we need for the biomarker? And it all depends. The answer is what is the purpose of the biomarker? As you can see, if the purpose is to use it as a prognostic or predictive factor, then uh, the, uh, uh, there is a higher stringency in terms of performance uh, verification. So definitely we want to make sure the biomarker has been, um, the level of evidence is high. And, uh, and for instance, for a lot of biomarkers that are continuous, the cutoff point has been well validated before it's uh, implemented in the trial. So this is a nice paper uh, published in Genetic and uh, Medicine in 2009. And it gives you a different uh, level, a hierarchy of evidence. So again, uh, uh, in terms of the evidence, we definitely uh, would say that uh, the higher the evidence comes mostly from meta-analyses of randomized clinical trials. But again, randomized clinical trials are also, uh, if we have data on a uh, biomarker, and that biomarker could be either a single biomarker or it could be a combination of biomarker, that level will be fine. So definitely this will be one of the highest level. Uh, and this is, of course, the next one will be a single randomized control trial. So in a minute terms, remaining. Okay, thank you. In terms of the biomarker processes, uh, usually people start uh, with the biomarker uh, discovery in terms of the pipeline. They move into the assay development and analytical validation that I've already touched briefly on. And then you look at the clinical validation, uh, a clinical utility, utility validation, and then it could be implemented if it goes uh, through all these steps. Uh, this is a very nice article that discussed the criteria for use of omics-based uh, prediction and predictors in clinical trials. Now, uh, a lot of these things touch on uh, how you prepare the specimens, collection, storage, and uh, what the uh, minimum amount of specimen. Uh, th th this is, again, for use of biomarker, or it could be for any uh, combination of biomarker, it could be something like Oncotype DX or Decipher, which is uh, commonly used in prostate and, um, and breast cancer. So there are uh, uh, assay issues that needs to be considered, uh, how you establish a detailed standard uh, operating procedure for the conduct of the assay, how uh, you establish accessibility criteria for quality of assay batches, and then the accept acceptability criteria for quality of assay batches and for results from individual specimen. So all these are, uh, of course, discussed in this uh, important paper that provides uh, the framework, and you want to ensure that the biomarker is performed in a CLIA certified lab if the results will be used to determine the treatment. So this is the norm here in the US that uh, it has to be in a CLIA certified lab. Uh, and then of course, the other point to consider is that the informed consent document need to be signed by study participant accurately that describe the risk and potential benefit associated with the use of OMIC test. Actually, this applies also for all biomarkers. So this has to be signed on the form and the patient will need to agree that their specimen be used not only for the current, but also for uh, future research. Uh, again, uh, minutes. 
remaining. Thank you. So uh, I uh, pretty much uh, gave you an overview uh, within this time period, and I made a distinction between the types of biomarker and the level of evidence, but there are other things to consider when we're designing a clinical trial, whether the objective is prevention or uh, therapeutic. Uh, and these things are the prevalence of the marker, the sensitivity and specificity of the marker, how reproducible it is, and whether the assay is valid or not and the feasibility of real-time assessment. If a marker takes several weeks uh, to have the readout from it, it may not be feasible to use in clinical trials. So I think biomarkers will continue to be used in clinical trials. The biomarker may be one, or it could be a combination of biomarkers, such as uh, Decipher score or Oncotype DX score. It serves different purposes. You can use it for enrichment. You can use it as a stratification factor or adjustment in the analysis. Thank you for your attention. Muchas gracias, Dr. Alabi. Thank you, Dr. Alabi. Thank you for your presentation on biomarkers, uses, types, and some other considerations. Next, we're going to start the round table. If you haven't written down your questions in the Q&A icon, you can write them down. We have 25 minutes for discussion. All right, thank you, Dasha. We're going to start with Dr. with Dr. Thompson. Doctor, we have a question, a common question, really. This is a question from everyone working in cancer today, is whether PSA detection is cost effective for the state in order to reduce death due to cancer. How would you answer that? And Dr. Jorge Gamboa is asking, what is the opinion that the task force does not recommend categorically early screening with PSA? These are very good questions. Because if it is efficient from an economic point of view, we do not know. We have not done that kind of study. The only thing we do know is that for the last 25 years, we have seen a low mortality in the United States. And we know in randomized trials, the PLCO study trial in the United States had some problems. Had a lot of utilization of PSA and randomized patients, the arm without, without early detection. There was more detection in that arm than in the other arm, actually. So the best study was in Europe. It seems it is necessary to do the antigen in about 800 to 1,000 persons and treat 27 persons so as not to have such a mortality in prostate cancer. It is not a, a utilization of medical pesos that is very efficient. It's, maybe it's not that efficient, but if we use it in a better way for detection of high-grade tumors, for instance, using the calculator we can change to doing biopsies in those who have a high grade risk instead of those that have low risk. 
The second question is the U.S. Preventive uh, Task Force. They are changing on and off their recommendations throughout the years. In the beginning, it meant talking with the discussing with the patient advantages and disadvantages and the risks of early detection. Two, during two, three years, they did not recommend. And now they have, they had a D for screening and they have changed to C where they recommend discussing with the patient the advantages and disadvantages. And I think that the problem is that there is no easy way to have that discussion in a 15, 20 minutes time in your office. Difficult to do for a primary care doctor in, in that period of time. But there are videos that you can use uh, to help the patient to pass that information to on to the patient. But it is difficult because we know that the risk drops and there are patients with very high grade tumors that live years and years without a recurrency of their tumor. The problem is that we are treating too much patients that won't have advantages. It is very difficult, and this is why it is necessary to have a discussion with the patient and also with the patient's wife sometimes. Thank you. Well, a question for Dr. Halabi. When estimating the sample size, should we take into consideration adjustments for studies that include biomarkers? Yes, of course, yes, Dr. Andri. Tomorrow she will be discussing this but it is very important to have the prevalence of the biomarker. That is a very important thing to when you consider the sample size. Thank you. I have a question for Dr. Corvalan. Dr. Corvalan, yesterday, in the excellent presentation about statistics in the United States, information was given about uh, American natives and gastric cancer was quite common in the tribes living along, along the West Coast, which is the Pacific Coast. Do you have anything to say about it? Do you think this is common in Latin America? that there is this association of gastric cancer and the Pacific Ocean? Well, I think that there must be some kind of association. And that was what I tried to show. When we speak about Latin America, the problem of gastric cancer is on the Pacific side and not that important on the Atlantic side. Clearly, the mortality rates show figures that are different on, on the two sides. And on the other hand, the other places with gastric cancer, Korea, Japan, China, that's also Pacific. So it seems that the gastric cancer problem is in the Pacific ring. One could speculate Maybe this has to do with volcanic activity, with environmental problems, but really I cannot go beyond those things. But I think it deserves some geographical, regional trials, ethnical, taking into account the ethnical component, component because in the Indian populations, it, it seems to be very prevalent. But I think this is a research that should be carried out. These are aspects that should be explored. 
to thank you, Gervais, for the Heliobacter in Esther. Uh, it is interesting to, which so in Alaska, uh, in Canada, in Alaska. Maybe a much easier question to answer is this problem of Chile and gastric cancer that is diagnosed in advanced stages. It will see Korea, 50% of cases detected in stage one, but most of the patients in Chile are advanced stage. How can we improve that? Maybe there is something regarding policies we have to implement. Well, I think that the endoscopy resource is very restricted. We do not have enough gastroenterologists nor equipment, and this will always be so, because clearly endoscopy is a very complex resource. It requires a physician, a special staff, a special infrastructure, so it is a restricted resource. And the indication for endoscopy, several studies point out that the indication for endoscopy is not always the right one. The experience in our campaigns shows clearly that about 50% of the endoscopies didn't have a priority and do not detect the expected number of gastric cancers. The campaigns showed that. We detected a low number of cancers, thinking that we have a waiting list where cancer could have been incubating or accumulating. The second problem I, I think is the endoscopic indication. And part of that has to do with several things that have to do with the identification of helicobacter in population around 40 years of age. And I think that is a useful way of cleaning the endoscopic demand to focus it on those high risk patients. And finally, what we have tried to do, and that has been important, more than studying cancer-associated markers, we are starting to do panels and working with markers that allow to identify the high risk. Maybe they are not that accurate, but they might allow to distinguish the high and low risk areas. Somehow, that could uh, help us create a hierarchy in the waiting list and see which of the 2,000 patients would be the priority patients, the 1,000 that have the first priority. I think we have to optimize a very restricted resource such as endoscopy. A question to Dr. Thompson. What is your opinion about the use of APE in open population? in low income countries or intermediate income countries like uh, Latin America? It is a good question. It is a little bit more difficult because it is necessary to have means of not only detecting, but treating in an efficient way with radiotherapy, surgery are not easy to perform without complications. In most of the cases, what we see is that those who have access to university hospitals and private clinics have more access than the rest. But it's a matter of early detection in all kinds of diseases. It is difficult to do if you cannot follow the treatment and if you cannot follow up the patient during all the patient's life. And also if you cannot treat the complications and side effects of the treatment. And these things are very common when you do surgery or radiotherapy. This is why it's a difficult issue. And in those populations, Maybe there are other means of using the national resources or money for the treatment of diseases. Maybe 
we have to decide and maybe it's better to apply those resources to other diseases like gastric cancer in countries where that cancer is more common. But if we are trying to find a way to reduce the mortality and morbidity of cancer, prostate is not the best. Probably lung cancer, gastric cancer, gut cancer, prostate is not the best. And that is a reason to work on prevention because for instance, finasteride is not very expensive. In the United States, it's one cent per pill. Very, very cost effective. Thank you, doctor. I have a question for Dr. Halabi. about the comment made by Dr. Gonzalez in the previous session, said to have biomarkers today, we need 90% of sensitivity and 80% of sensitivity in order to accept it. I would like your opinion. Do you think there are absolute levels they have to do to go area under the curve or ROC, something that has to be met in order to become a clinical biomarker. Sí, uh, gracias. Es un uh, muy important. Yes, uh, thank uh, you. Uh, uh, muy importante uh, pregunta. That is a very uh, important question. The sensitivity and specificity of a biomarker que está más, uh, alto, yo needs pienso, en to mi be opinión, uh, higher, I think, than 90%. Uh, pero uh, es dependiente Que but hay, si hay it otras depends on esta, whether there um, are other biomarkers no. for that cancer uh, or not. Quizás es mejor explicar en Maybe inglés, it's better to explain uh, in English because my okay. Spanish uh, is... So it depends that, on uh, relevant to what. Uh, so if the uh, if your uh, primary uh, objective is to just test whether a biomarker is prognostic. Uh, it, it may not matter too much at this stage what the sensitivity and the specificity is. If you are using the biomarker, for instance, in a population for screening, like Dr. Thompson mentioned, people use PSA, and he's more of an expert on that. Uh, definitely you want uh, the sensitivity and the specificity to be high. Uh, and definitely, in general, you want those to be high, like higher than 80 or 90%. But if you're developing the level of evidence, obviously nothing is going to start very high. And this is where um, the clinical, the, uh, the, the analytical validation is going to be very important because this is where in the lab people are going to spend time uh, to bring up uh, you know, to tweak that assay so that the sensitivity and the specificity is ready to be moved on to the next phase where you're relating it to the outcomes. Could I say something real quick? Yes, Please. absolutely, Dr. Thompson. Well, um, Dr. Halabi is one of the most brilliant biostatisticians in the world, and I have tremendous respect, but I was just going to ask, doesn't it really depend on which cancer you're looking for? Um, for example, uh, the natural history, if it's a very short natural history with early metastasis, something like ovarian cancer, where if you have a, um, a marker that gives you an indication that it's present and you end up doing a laparoscopic hysterectomy on women, um, the invasiveness of that, or for example, lung cancer where you're going to do a thoracotomy on someone and the potential impact on a smoker with COPD taking away some lung volume for a small nodule that turns out to be a granuloma 
the impact is huge. It depends on the kind of cancer that you're dealing with. I'd, I'd be interested in your thoughts. Yeah, no, that that's really an excellent point. And, uh, and this is why I said it depends. I mean, ideally, yes, you want to have a sensitivity and specificity that's high, but there are other factors to consider. Uh, if the assay is very invasive, then, you know, maybe it won't be, uh, it won't have clinical utility, right? Because uh, these are other things to consider. It's not only uh, the, uh, the biomarker uh, in terms of level of evidence, in terms of uh, the biomarker, how you're using it in a clinical trial, whether it's prognostic or predictive or diagnostic, you have to consider all these collectively and you have to weigh them. If uh, it's a difficult to assay or uh, it's gonna be invasive, uh, then I think people will need to go back to the drawing line and come up with a better biomarker, right? Uh, I mean, there are most of the biomarkers like I've shown in the first uh, few slides were based on blood, uh, plasma, or it could be uh, serum. Uh, there are some from saliva, but there are others too that may be uh, from tissue. Uh, like uh, prostate cancer is easy to maybe have in a biopsy, but in others, let's say lung cancer, uh, if you are, uh, you know, let's say EGFR positive, uh, you're looking at testing patients for EGFR positive, it may not be easy to get that result from a specimen than uh, uh, from a tissue specimen than a blood, right? Because that's going to be more invasive. So maybe people are willing to lower uh, the level of sensitivity and specificity. Maybe someone would say if... Uh, a test is going to be more accurate based on a tissue as opposed to blood. Um, but as a statistician, I think we really need to hold, hold those levels very high at 90% or higher. Uh, and the reason why I'm saying that, because I think we are going to be uh, doing a disservice to our scientific community and the patients. So which means that the lab would need to work on something that's more uh, clinically uh, usable. Thank you. Perfect. Um, bueno, una pregunta para Dr. Corbalan. Uh, Question to Dr. Corbalan. How have you dealt with the biobanks challenges in hospitals that are not dedicated to research? What uh, can you do to collaborate and uh, take aliquots? Traditionally, we work where there is a certain level of infrastructure and clinical interest in doing research. And that is what happened in Villarrica, where we created a unit with an important effort, but we created a physical space that didn't exist using an infrastructure that the hospital has used to grow. That hospital has grown based on containers. 50% of the hospital is container-based, so as to speak. So if there is research interest, we have created research units in hospitals and the others have been places that have something to start with because there's already some initiative of Biobank or the campaigns that last for one month, the hospitals have uh, given us space for some time. We hire local people and with one or two persons from Santiago providing the support and the advice. So it's like a joint venture. And we are solving for them a clinical problem. So we combine research with solving a healthcare need. And that, I think, has been the key to success. Thank you, Dr. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Ian Thompson. Um, this is from Dr. Uh, Garnett Anderson. Is it possible to estimate the extent to which the likely Finasteride reduction in the PCA mortality is attributable to better uh, early detection versus direct effect of the drug on the disease process. 
Um, and I'll answer that to Garnet in, in English. Um, the, it's, it's a very good question. So um, at the end of the study, when all the biopsies were done, there was a 25% reduction. We did not know at that particular time that all of the detection biases were biasing towards an even greater detection with finasteride so that the PSA biased towards it. So if cancer was present, those ROC curves are, if, if I like to say if those ROC curves were a diagnostic test, they would have received immediate registration as a diagnostic test by the FDA. They're highly significant, even for Gleason 7 disease. Um, rectal exam was improved. Um, uh, it also showed, the slide that I showed showed how bad rectal exam is for detection of prostate cancer. And the detection of high grade disease was also dramatically improved. And so when Mary Redman put all those biases into the pot, um, she suggested that the, the, the actual reduction was more like about 30% with about a 27% reduction in the risk of high grade disease. So that's a kind of our best guess using the modeling. And there were about, my recollection is five or six other publications that took all those biases into account. And what's really fascinating is that the reduction in risk of mortality was down by 25%. All kind of lines up all together, although not statistically significant because if you can imagine 19,000 people participated in the trial, there's only like 100 people who died of prostate cancer. So it's inherently confounded by the need for ascertainment and that ascertainment reduced the mortality. So you really don't know. And the only way that you would know would be to run a study of a 100,000, 200,000 people for 25 or 30 years, which is not gonna happen. So it's our best guess. So most of it appears to be, um, if anything, the detection bias biases against finasteride that shows that there is about a, about a 25 to 30% risk reduction. Muchas gracias. Bueno. Eh, ya se acabó el tiempo. Muchas gracias. All right, por... time is up. Thank you very much for your participation in this discussion. Thanks for your presentations today. Tomorrow, we will continue with the clinical research and translational research. And we will speak more about challenges and opportunities for research in Latin America opportunities for collaboration with SWOG. And we will listen to a presentation by Dr. Redman. She was mentioned by Dr. Thompson. Before closing, please answer the poll and see you tomorrow. Bye, Susan. <laughs>